Alright guys, today we are going to be studying the recognition and treatment of hyperkalemia. Now this is going to be pretty much a review, uh, something to help us study for our FPC and our CCPC exams in which you will see some electrolyte emergencies. But the good thing for us though is that hyperkalemia is one of the only electrolyte emergencies that we're going to see on these exams. The other ones are kind of like pseudo emergencies, not so much a critical emergency like hyperkalemia. So, if you always think hyper K equals EKG, okay, you're going to use, this is one of the rare th rare times where you're actually going to use your EKG in order to diagnose your condition and treat your condition, all right? So we're talking about potassium. Potassium is our most abundant intracellular cation, just remember potent, sodex, so potent, potassium, intracellular. The most abundant intracellular cation. So when we measure the potassium, the normal extracellular potassium is about three and a half to five millimoles per liter. Anything greater than five is hyper K. So when you're taking your exams and your patient is showing signs or some EKG changes and their potassium is greater than say 5.5, you should probably treat your patient. Anything lower than three and a half is hypo K. We're gonna leave that for another lecture. So talking about causes. Well, when we talk about the causes of hyper K, we have to keep into a fact that there's artifact, right? Spurious causes, quote unquote. The most common cause of hyper K is, of course, hemolysis, drawing of the blood. You start a small gauge uh, IV, you put a lot of pressure on it, you hemolysize the red blood cells, they leak, they go to the lab, and they show a high levels of potassium. It's not technically a lab error unless they spin the blood too fast. Uh, that would be a lab error, but it's mainly us, all right? We are the number one cause of hyperkalemia. Um, thrombocytosis, a lot of platelets will cause an elevated potassium. A lot of white blood cells will cause a lot of, or uh, cause high potassium. So if you're taking your test question and you have an elevated platelet count or you have elevated uh, white blood cell count, it might be a spurious cause of your hyper-K and it might not be a true hyperkalemic emergency. And of course, leaving the tourniquet on for too long, leaves all that potassium there in the venous system can cause elevated potassium levels. And we already talked about lab error being the cause. So know your artifacts, know your spurious causes of hyper K. All right. Then we can have redistribution causes. You can remember the mnemonic aids for this. All right. So A would be acidosis. Occult acidosis will cause a rise in your potassium levels. Insulin deficiency. Well, without going too far into the physiology, because again, this is too, just, just a, a basic review, is that insulin cannot bind the potassium and it can't enter the cell if we have an insulin deficiency. And that's one of the jobs of insulin. So if we have a relative insulin deficiency like our type one diabetics, we can get a hyperkalemic type episode in which needs to be treated. Then we think of D, our drugs, all right? Classically, you're gonna see your patients with uh, taking ACE inhibitors or NSAIDs are going to have an elevated K. We also got to keep in mind that beta blockers can cause it. We give those in the field. Digitalis can cause it. A lot of patients are on DIG. Um, part of the path of the pharmacokinetics behind DIG is that it actively competes for the receptors. And when it does that, it slows down the sodium ATP pump, uh, pump and you retain more calcium. If you retain more calcium, potassium can't get into the cell and therefore you have extracellular hyper K. All right, we're going to talk about that a little bit more la uh, later. Um, also, one of the big bad boys here is a nectine. When we give succinylcholine in the field, you can expect the potassium to raise, to, uh, to raise by about one, uh, one millimole. So if you have a patient who's hyperkalemic, you, you might not want to give your sucks. That's, an, that's a contraindication for it. But still, those drugs can cause a, uh, a rise in your, in your potassium level. So when you're taking your test and you draw the potassium level, it gives you a number. We're not really treating our patients based on that number. We're treating the patients based on their EKG changes. All right. So there are five classic changes in your patients with high potassium. All right. Your first one is going to be your tall peaked uh, T waves. They're going to hurt. You know, if you sit on them, if you look like if you sit on them, they would hurt you. Um, you're going to have your loss of your P wave followed by widening of your QRS complex, followed by your prolonged PR and your sine wave. Now, you know, the patient doesn't follow the book um, for these types of changes. You might run on a patient, you just might see a widened, bizarre QRS complex. Or you might run on the patient, you just might see tall peak T waves. And they don't 
necessarily correlate with your potassium uh, levels. You know, you're not always going to get a widening of the QRS with a potassium of eight. You're not always going to get a sine wave with a potassium of nine. It's loosely correlated, but you know, you're really using your EKG changes as a sign of whether or not this is a hyperkalemic emergency or not. All right. So let's look at this one. We look at the CKG, and this isn't an EKG lecture, but the, the main thing I want you guys to focus on are your T waves. All right. So these T waves here, if we kind of look at those right there. There's a couple of things that we notice. One, we have a, uh, our, our QT isn't prolonged. And because our QT isn't prolonged, we can say that this T wave here is narrow. Now we have a narrow base and we have a very pointy top, all right, in all of these. And let's, uh, let's zoom in on that. All right, we can see that. Very narrow base, pointy top, all right. That's your Eiffel Tower T wave. It's also very symmetrical, all right. The upslope, is the same as the downslope, and that's good. So we can kind of distinguish this between a hyper K T wave and a hyper acute T wave. Also, I don't notice any, you know, very minimal elevation here in AVR, half millimeter maybe, uh, no reciprocal changes. So these are your hyper K T waves. That's classically what you're going to see. All right. Also on this EKG, we also notice a couple other things. We have no P wave. All right. We already have the loss of the P waves here. In our inferior leads, we see them here in AVL. In our, all of our percordium, we have loss of our P wave. All right, so that's two two findings of uh, of hyper K. All right, loss of P wave and our peaked T waves. Now let's look at this one. All right, this is taken from a patient with a potassium level of nine. All right, so we can look at that. And that's a very peaked T, narrowing base. That's also a prolonged QT interval there. All right. So this patient is sick. This would be a hyperkalemic um, emergency. We also have loss of P wave and widening of our QRS complexes. All right. So we can see that by just by the EKG here, this would be a hyperkalemic emergency. And of course, if you see this patient with your sine wave, very bizarre looking QRS complex, and as Amal Matu says, wide bizarre QRS complex just give calcium all right it is hyper k until proven otherwise just give calcium and you never want to capture you never want to diagnose hyperkalemia on a 12 lead with a sine wave because that means you're already uh you know one step uh, away from the from the game there so here's the different causes of your tall t waves we're differentiating between our hyper k and our hyper acute all right hyper acute hyper k t waves narrow base pointy top it hurts when you sit on it Hyperacute T waves, huge, huge T waves when compared to the R wave, widened base, and the QT interval is going to be pretty much prolonged. Although it's not in this example here, it will be. It'll be a lot longer than it would be that you would expect from a hyper K. All right. So hyperacute and hyper K. Well, let's look at this one. I just kind of threw this in there so you can kind of appreciate it. But if we go ahead and zoom in on that T wave, look at that. It's a wide base. Look at this one in V2 here. We have a slurring upstroke and a rapid downstroke. That is not symmetrical. Wide base, not symmetrical. That is not a hyper K T wave. This, these are hyper acute T waves. All right. Also, that biphasic T wave in V1 is also uh, a good sign there. But those are hyper acute T waves. So just kind of review on yourself, kind of know the differences between them when you're in the field and when you're practicing. All right. Here as well, we have a, um, let's zoom in on that right there. We have a kind of a slurred upstroke here, rapid downstroke. This is your hyperacute T's, hyperacute T's, ST elevation in V1. We also have greater than one millimeter in AVR, which is uh, a good indicator of LAD. So AVR. Slurring upstroke, rapid downstroke, good indicator of hyperacute T waves. All right. So when we're looking at our symptoms for hyper K other than our EKG, they're very vague. You know, you have weakness, malaise, paralysis, lethargy. So we can say hyper K equals EKG, and that's what we're going to use. All right. So on your test, you're going to have to figure out the treatment. Well, there's three things. There's three steps that we have to do in order to treat our hyper K patients. One, we've got to stabilize the cell. 
After we stabilize the cell, we got to shift that potassium from extracellular into the intracellular uh, space. After that, we got to remove the potassium from the body. All right. Use the mnemonic C big K drop. That'll kind of help you out. It leaves out a couple things, but you know, whatever. It's a mnemonic. It's there to help you. So C big K drop. We're talking calcium, bicarb, insulin, glucose, K exalate, dialysis, diuretics. All right. And we're going to talk about those. So stabilize the cell. Calcium. Well, when you give calcium, you got to keep in mind that calcium does not change the potassium level at all. All it does is buy us time. It buys us about 20 to 30 minutes in order to do something. And when you give calcium, you're going to see, or hopefully you're going to see, your QRS complex narrow. So the only time you're going to give calcium is when you see a wide complex QRS on your EKG. Right? Wide complex equals hyper K emergency equals calcium. If you don't see a wide complex, it's not a hyper K emergency and you don't need to give calcium. All right? Now, there, I haven't really seen a lot of abstracts about giving calcium empirically so you don't see EKG changes in the future. That's just going to be based upon your practice and your style point. There's two types of calcium that we can give. There's calcium gluconate and there's calcium chloride. Calcium gluconate needs liver clearance. You need to give three times more calcium than you get, need to give calcium chloride. Calcium chloride is immediately available but it's very necrotic so a lot of people don't like to give it in a peripheral line they like to give it in a central line because it is it does cause a lot of tissue necrosis but you don't have to give as much and it's rapidly readily available so emergency hyper k emergency calcium chloride hyper k not emergency calcium gluconate all right so emergency is your calcium chloride three times the calcium and it's immediately available not emergency you're going to stick with your calcium gluconate Calcium is going to stabilize the cell membrane. It does not change your potassium levels at all. It's just going to stabilize the electrical gradient. And when you see a wide complex QRS, you give your calcium and you move on. All right. So if we're going to give our calcium gluconate, we're given 10 mLs over two to five minutes. If we're given calcium chloride, we're given 10 mLs over two to five minutes. Same, uh, same mLs. Now keep in mind that if your patient has a dig toxicity, if they're taking DIG and you suspect that it's DIG toxicity with hyper-K and you see that slurring scooped ST segment, then um, you want to give your infusion of calcium over a longer period of time, probably over 20 minutes, but you also might want to consider giving magnesium for that patient as well. All right? So once we stabilize the cell with giving calcium, then we want to shift the potassium into the cell. All right? And how we do that? classically is by giving insulin and glucose at the same time all right by giving insulin and glucose at the same time you're going to drop your potassium by about one millimole per liter in one hour all right which is great it works very good we're going to give 10 units of insulin and 50 grams of d50 to a five to one ratio and that seems to work the best if you give it at five to one ratio of insulin and d50 now you don't have to give your D50 if your patient is showing signs of hyperglycemia or the sugar is over 250. All right, they already have enough free sugar to give. So over 250, you don't have to give it. Under 250, give your two amps of, uh, of D50 with 10 units of, of your insulin. All right. You can also give sodium bicarb. Now in the literature lately, it's showing that bicarb only works if the patient is acidotic. If they're not acidotic, the sodium bicarb is not going to work. They need an excess of hydrogen ions in order for that bicarb to pull out the hydrogen and work. So if they're not acidotic, the bicarb will not work. If they are acidotic, you can give you one amp, 50 MEQs over five minutes, and you're moving on. All right. So you can also give albuterol at large doses. 10 to 20 milligrams via nebulizer. Just dump some albuterol in there and let it go. All right. This beta-2 agonism kind of speeds up the Krebs cycle, speeds up the burning of your potassium, and will lower it. It works really, really well. All right. The salbutamol can actually lower your potassium one millimole per liter in about 30 minutes. So you got to keep in mind that if you're treating your patient with um, insulin and glucose and, and now you're giving your albuterol, you don't want to lower the potassium too, too quickly, especially if your patient is not a dire emergency. All right. And it can actually maintain that level for up to two hours. So it's very effective, especially in patients that are renal failure patients or are fluid overloaded. Um, albuterol will work quite well with that. So you can nebulize the albuterol in as well. All right. 
Now, after we've stabilized the membrane by giving calcium, we've shifted the potassium intracellularly by giving our insulin, our glucose, possibly sodium bicarb, and our butyrol, we want to get it out. We want to get it out of the body. So the number one way to get it out of the body, or the number one thing to help us, is to increase urinary output, increase kidney function, increase GFR by giving our normal saline. All right? It promotes that diuresis. We can also give Lasix. Lasix is a potassium depleting uh, type diuretic. So we can give 20 to 80 milligrams depending on their hydration. And we're using our normal saline to augment that. But it wastes the potassium. It helps us urinary excrete the potassium, especially in fluid overloaded patients. We might want to give that to them anyway. And that'll help us get the potassium out of the body. All right. Or we can give our k -exalate. Now there's a lot of things, I've read a lot of abstracts, and if you listen to uh, Scott Weingart and, uh, and Smart EM, they have a lot, they have a whole series about how k doesn't work. But k is our cation exchange resin, that's going to exchange positives for negatives, which is going to be beneficial. Uh, if you do give k you know, you want to make sure that you administer with sorbitol. Uh, if you don't, it can cause bowel impaction. Uh, but one of the things about it, is that it's been known to cause bowel necrosis. It's a risk. So, um, you know, it's one of those things that if your patient is not critically ill, hyper-K emergency, EKG, your patient has a potassium of 6 or 5.5 and they're stable, that's a KXLA patient. Your patient who is critically ill, um, that needs their potassium level dropped, that has YQRS, uh, we're kind of saving the k for uh, for other patients, all right? Dose is 50 grams, administered in 30 mLs of sorbitol, all right? And that's your treatment of hyper-K. So remember your treatments, your insulin, glucose, or calcium, insulin, glucose, sodium bicarb, if acidotic, nebulized albuterol, get it out of the body by giving normal saline, giving Lasix, uh, k -exalate. and last-ditch effort is, of course, dialysis. Until next time, guys. See ya.